السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الحمد لله رب العالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد وبارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت وباركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد أما بعد إن شاء الله we continue translating the book how to live longer or how to make your life more uh, worthy by doing more good deeds. Uh, we were doing last week, we finished the section about As-Salah, the section about As-Salah. And in that section, the Sheikh spoke about uh, As-Salah in Al-Haramain, praying in the two sacred mosques uh, Masjid al-Haram and al-Masjid al-Nabawi and how uh, if you pray there then it's uh, your salah is worth much more salah that you pray elsewhere and therefore if you try your best to perform more umrahs and more hajj uh, then this way the more you pray in these two masajid the more you will bring a lot of blessings in into your life uh, the second point was to pray the congregational prayer in the masjid, Salat al-Jama'ah, as Salat al-Jama'ah is worth 27 times more than the prayer that you pray by yourself. So if you continuously pray at the masjid in congregation, then your uh, life, the value of your life increases 27 times. Uh, also, he mentioned to pray the voluntary prayers at home, to pray the voluntary prayers at home for the salah that you pray at home, the voluntary prayer that you pray at home is worth 25 times more the voluntary prayer that you pray in the masjid or you pray in front of other people. So if you pray the sunnah, try to pray the sunnah at home, if you pray voluntary, extra voluntary prayers, then try to pray at home as much as you can. Uh, the next thing was to uh, adorn yourself with some of the etiquettes of uh, the Jumu'ah, basically to go early for the Jumu'ah, to uh, get closer to the Imam, to listen and to pay uh, attention, to take a full shower, on the day of Jumu'ah to walk to the masjid rather than uh, driving to the masjid. This will increase uh, the value of your life because every step you make to the masjid, every step you make to the masjid it is worth one full year of fasting and night prayers. One full year of fasting and night prayers. So if you walk to the masjid and he used the example of 1,000 steps to the masjid, then you are adding 1,000 years of fasting and night prayers to your life. 1,000 years of fasting and prayer, night prayer, in your life. So if you do that and the Jumu'ah in the month is four times or five times, then you are you're adding 4,000 to 5,000 years of fasting and night prayers to your life. This shows the worth of Jumu'ah. We can talk about Jumu'ah in terms of that it is an obligation and that if you don't attend it consecutively three times, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will seal the heart of such a person who neglects the Jumu'ah for three times, three consecutive times. We can talk about this side, but then the uh, the aim of this book is to shed light on the other side, the side of the worth of the good deeds that you can accumulate just if you uh, take uh, some precautionary measures. Uh, just take care of few things that are easy. Every one of us is careful to come to the Jumu'ah. But then we might, you know, just delay the shower to the last minute leave from home last minute, leave from work last minute. Even some of us, maybe something that is really unworthy will, will pull us back, will keep us back from coming.
coming to the Jumu'ah early. Oh, let me just buy this thing from the store. And that thing will make you come later than what you should. Uh, let me just do this first or do that. Pa pa pass by such and such place first and then go to the masjid. That thing causes you to come late and therefore you will not be written amongst those who came early and therefore you will, leave, you will miss those thousands of years of fasting and night prayers where even if you lived four thousand years you will not be fasting every day in those years but then by coming to the Jumu'ah early and observing these etiquettes that are mentioned in this hadith then you add thousands of years into your life of good deeds into your life the last thing is that was mentioned is to continuously pray Salat al-Duha to continuously pray Salat al-Duha and he mentioned the hadith that the body of the son of Adam has 360 joints and if you uh, donate one or do one good deed for every joint meaning 360 charities or 360 good deeds then you will end up pushing yourself away from the fire for that day if you donate or do an act of charity uh, or a good deed for every joint the total is 360 if you do 360 hasanat then you have pushed yourself that day you secured that day you secured yourself that you are pushed away from the fire this you can achieve if you pray just the two rak'at of Salat al-Duha which is like 10 minutes after sunrise up to 10 minutes before Salat al-Duha before the timing of Salat al-Duha that is the time of Salat al-Duha if you pray two rak'at within this time frame then inshallah uh, these days it's about 7.40 in the morning uh, up until around uh, 1 30 uh, or before 1 30 1 20 almost because Dhuhr is around 1 30 so uh, between 7 40 a.m. up until 1 20 right just before Dhuhr that is the time for Salat al duha if you pray two rak'at only then there is 360 good deeds achieved five minutes but then it will save you a lot of time and a lot of effort and it will earn you those 360 aside from the other rewards uh, for Salat al-Duha that we will get to know inshallah so that was the section about Salah the section today uh, the second section is about Hajj and Umrah the Sheikh says that there is no doubt that the Muslim he will not be able to perform pilgrimage to uh, the sacred house except once in one year every year and there is no doubt that every Muslim wishes to perform pilgrimage every year and he wishes that he will even live 1,000 years so that he will perform pil pilgrimage uh, every year but then no matter how much the Muslim would be careful and diligent to uh, perform Hajj every year then the number of times he performs Hajj it cannot be more than the years that he lives this is why if someone if a Muslim it was said about him that he performed 60 pilgrimages 60 times he went for Hajj it means that his life span is not less than 60 years because he can do Hajj once a year that's it but then how can we do more how can we have more uh, of Hajj more number uh, more uh, performance of Hajj so that the number of Hajj that we perform will outnumber the years that we live so that the number of Hajj that we have will outnumber the number of years that we live uh, it is to be careful and diligent to do the good deeds uh, whose rewards will equal Hajj and Umrah and this is now the second section this is what the Sheikh will be talking about so uh, this is what we will do of course Hajj is done once a year because it has 
certain prescribed days, right? Al-Hajj Ashurun Ma'lumat. Hajj is performed in uh, months that are known. So it's not like you can perform a Hajj every time you want, whenever you wish. Unlike Umrah, you can do all, all year round, but then Hajj, it's only done during that period of time. And you have to match the day of Arafah and Ayyam al Tashriq and so on and so forth. Uh, one of the um, older ladies who performed Hajj, I was told that she was complaining about the, the people who reside in Arabia, the Saudis and the rest who are residing in Arabia. She was saying, you are living here, you can do Hajj anytime. Why are you bothering us coming this time, the same time as we are doing Hajj, <laughs> right? <laughs> Obviously, Hajj cannot be done except in those days. That's why everybody is crowded and crams in those days, all of them in one place and one time, right? Because that's the only time you can do it. You cannot do it whenever you wish, right? So that is the case. So now he will start talking about how to uh, or what are the deeds that you can do by which you can get the reward of a Hajj or Umrah or both. And he actually mentions six, six uh, points. We might be able to finish two of them this time. The first way, the first means in which you can achieve the reward of Hajj is تَحْجِيزُ عَدَدٍ مِّنَ النَّاسِ بِمَالِكِ كُلَّ عَامٍ قَدْرَ الْإِمْكَانِ To sponsor people to perform Hajj every year as much as you are able to. The Sheikh says that many of our pious predecessors, as Salaf, they, are, they were so careful and diligent to perform a lot of Hajj and a lot of Umrah. This is because they wanted to apply or they wanted to respond to the call of the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu anh, narrated to us. That Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Tabi'u bayna al hajj wal umrah, fa inna huma yanfiyani al faqra wal dhunub, kama yanfi al kiru khabath al hadid wal dhahab wal fiddah. This hadith is narrated by Al Imam Ahmad and also uh, Al Tirmidhi and also Al Nasa'i. It is an authentic uh, hadith. Uh, it's in different uh, in, in other books also so this hadith says follow up between hajj and umrah follow up between hajj and umrah following up between them and you perform hajj then you do a umrah then you do a umrah then you do a hajj then like that you follow up between hajj and umrah for they both they remove poverty and sins they remove poverty and sins exactly like the bellows removes the impurity of gold, uh, uh, the impurity of iron, gold, and silver. The bellows, this is the tool that the uh, blacksmith, the person works on iron, this is the tool that he uses to separate the impurities from the metal. So they, um, they make the fire, the flame, and then they put those metals and then they blow on them. And then uh, they separate the metal, the, the real metal from the impurities that are stuck to it. So Hajj and Umrah and following up between Hajj and Umrah removes two things, removes poverty. Unlike what many people think that uh, if you spend your money in Hajj then you, <laughs> you lose a lot of money. But then, if you spend it, this is like you are spending fi sabilillah. Because hajj is jihad fi sabilillah. So you're spending money in that, then it is as if you are spending in jihad, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless your money. Allah will remove the poverty. Now many people, they ask about, can I perform hajj if I have dain or debt? I am indebted to someone, can I perform hajj? If that person that you are indebted to, if he's asking you to pay the money now or as soon as possible, then you cannot go. You pay your debt first. Debt is a priority before Hajj. You are unable to perform Hajj. Hajj is only a must for those who are able. But then if 
that person is not asking you now, he's giving you time to pay within three years, five years, seven years, and you are able to go, then you can go, inshallah. You do not have to uh, wait until you pay off your debt. And performing Hajj or Umrah, inshallah, will actually help you to pay off your debt. It's not going to delay you. It's going to bless your money in a way that you do not know that you will be able to pay off your debt without uh, problems. So Hajj and Umrah following up between them removes poverty and also removes sins, clears you of your sins and disobediences that you have committed. So uh, going for Hajj and Umrah a lot has a lot of value and worth. That's why the scholars of the past, the Sheikh said, they used to be so careful to try to perform as many Hajj and Umrah as they can. Now he mentions examples from the book Seer Alam al Nubala. Al Aswad ibn Yazid, he went to the house 80 times between Hajj and Umrah. He went 80 times between Hajj and Umrah. Amr ibn Maymun, he uh, went 60 times. Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib, he went 40 times. And other than them, many others, they did the same thing. He said, yani, you should reflect and ponder over the fact that in their time, the means of transportation is not the same that we are enjoying now. What do you think if those very easy means of transportation that are available now would have been available for them then. What do you think they will do? If with all of these difficulties, they're going 60, 40, 80 times, what do you think if they have those easy means of transportation where you depart from the airport tonight and tomorrow you are in Jeddah and you can go to Mecca and perform and then finish and then you can get back the next day on the plane and come back here. What do you think they will do if they had those uh, the, these means of transportation that we have now. The Sheikh said that if one of us decided to travel to Mecca to perform the rites of Hajj uh, and he will do that voluntary Hajj and he already secured the Hajj of Islam uh, the cost that he will pay, that he will incur uh, generally it will be not less than uh, يعني, thousands of reals, you know, 6,000, 7,000, 5,000, 8,000 reals. In our case, if you're going for Hajj, then you're talking 6,000 and up, 6,000 Canadian dollars and up. If you're talking Umrah, then يعني, uh, it depends. If you are going for five days or six days and coming back, you're looking at 2,000, 2,500 up to 3,000 even depending on what package you choose, right? So just the ticket on its own is like 1,800 or 17 or 15. Add to that another four or 700 for your cost for the hotels and whatever you need there. Uh, so he said that if you are careful uh, in terms of trying to increase the number of hajj, the number of pilgrimages that you perform, even if you yourself don't go to hajj, then what is upon you to do, if you want to increase the number of hajj that you perform, what you need to do is to give priority, give preference to others by you know, giving them the cost of uh, the hajj and uh, allowing uh, a number of poor people who cannot, uh, who do not have the means, who do not have the financial means to perform the hajj, then you pay for them to establish this uh, rukun, this pillar of Islam, which actually is dropped from them. For them, because they are poor, it's not an obligation anymore because they are, they are not able to afford it. So it's dropped from them. But then now you are helping them by, uh, instead of paying this money 
for your Hajj, you are sponsoring others to perform Hajj. He said, or you can uh, sponsor some of the Muslim uh, employees in your area, in your city, as many people in Arabia, they work there, and they are unable to go to Hajj. Uh, so he's saying, sponsor these employees uh, to go uh, to Hajj, or he said, you would uh, sponsor some people who entered into the religion of Allah uh, recently. Yeah, and he became Muslims recently, new Muslims. And this can be done by cooperating with one of the da'wah offices that are specialized in calling uh, non-Muslims to Islam. And they are available in many of the cities in our land that he's talking about, Arabia, uh, alhamdulillah. So these offices, may Allah bless their efforts, they have yearly programs to uh, sponsor the Hajj for hundreds of new Muslims with the lowest costs. And uh, this is sponsored by some of the uh, people who just charitable people, muhsineen. They just sponsor these, uh, these uh, people to perform Hajj. Uh, the same يعني, is available to us here. We can donate to these offices or Many of us, uh, they, we come from different uh, countries, and here it's six thousand or seven thousand dollars. But then, if you uh, sponsor someone to perform Hajj from Lebanon or from Syria or from uh, Bangladesh or from Pakistan or from India or Sri Lanka, uh, six thousand dollars or seven thousand, uh, يعني, uh, you can. How many from Bangladesh? Two or three? Three people. So now even if you don't go, right? Actually, this is the number that he mentions. It will come, man. So if you can sponsor three people, sometimes you want to go, but you, you don't get enough time vacation from work. You cannot do this every year, right? Because you need three, three weeks for Hajj, three weeks and more, right? You can shorten it to two weeks, but then you will really, you will really be <laughs> pushing it. You will be under pressure. So three weeks would be a very nice time to take off of work. So sometimes you cannot do this every year because you have other things to look after. So then you sponsor people to perform Hajj, even if you don't go yourself. He mentioned that Al-Faqih Al-Zahid, Muslim Ibn Yasar, he used to perform Hajj every year. And he used to sponsor along with him uh, people, men of his uh, brethren, uh, who got used to that from him. Every year he will take them, he will go and he will take them. That's his company, he will take them with him. Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, Amir al muminin fil Hadith. This one is like a, a shining star in the world of uh, Ahlul Hadith, Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, alayhi rahmatullah, Amir al-Mu'mineen fil Hadith. Yeah, that's what they call him, Prince of Believers, in terms of Hadith. Uh, he was a scholar and he was rich also, rahimahullah. So, uh, at the time of Hajj, he will, uh, his friends from the people of uh, city of Maru, hmm, they will gather together and they will say, we accompany you. So he says, bring the money that you will be spending for Hajj, Nafaqat. So he takes this money from them and he puts it in a box and he locks that box. Then he will rent for them the rides and you know whatever, the caravan. And so they leave from Maru, the city of Maru, to the city of Baghdad. So he spends over them. He uh, feeds them the best uh, type of food and the best type of sweets also, Atiyab al-Halwa. Then he will uh, take them from the city of Baghdad in the best clothing and uh, they are w really well taken care of. Uh, until they reach the city of the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, al-Madina. So he says to everyone, 
what did your family ask you to buy them from Medina, from the special things of Medina? So he says this and that, this and that. So he buys that for them. Then he will take them to Mecca. If they finish the Hajj, he asks each one of them, saying, what did your family ask you to buy from uh, the merchandise of Mecca? So he says this and that. So he buys that for them. Then they leave from Mecca. He takes them from Mecca, continues to spend over them until they get back to the city of Maru. So uh, he said uh, that he beautifies or he fixes for them their uh, homes and their doors, yani, um, paints. He paints the, the houses and the doors, and yani he looks after them even after they reach back home. He looks after the homes. So after three days after they reach, he will make a big walima for them, a big uh, feast for everybody. And he will clothe them also. And after they eat and they are happy, then he will bring that box, that locked box. He opens it and he gives back the money to each one of them. So he sponsors the whole, the whole trip. The whole trip and uh, mashallah, he looks after them in, in total. And then he gives them, gives them back the money that they have saved for this trip. The Sheikh said that I am not calling you to do like Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak <laughs> did. <laughs> for many of us, he says, many of us are unable to do that. I suspect even if we are able, <laughs> how many of us will do that? So he said, but what you are able to do or whatever you are able to do, what is within your capacity is for you to donate the cost of your hajj for those who did not perform pilgrimage yet. He says that uh, the amount of 1,500 riyals roughly uh, in our time will be sufficient to sponsor the Hajj of one employee of the many Muslims uh, in Arabia. Uh, and uh, many of the Hajj groups, they will take them for this much. So if you sponsor <clears throat> three people every year, then you will earn the reward of three Hajjat, three pilgrimages in one year. So it is as if you have added to your life three years and as if you have performed Hajj in one time in those three years every year you perform Hajj it's as if you added to your life three years right three years so then would you would you give priority or prefer others over yourself over you your voluntary Hajj you already performed Hajjatul Islam he's uh, supposing so now you do donate the cost of your hajj to others so this this way you will increase your uh, life span your productive lifespan right your productive lifespan so some people if they are going to go themselves as he was saying you will pay six thousand riyals seven thousand riyals maybe more depending on how extravagant the group that you go with, right? So now he's saying 1,500 riyals will take one person to Hajj, right? So for, for 6,000 riyals, you can take four to Hajj. So one year you don't go, and then you sponsor four people. That's in Arabia, right? In our case here, as I said, yani if you are going... Uh, Yani, the cheapest I have seen is something like 5,000. That was last year. And you are staying in, uh, in Al-Aziziyah, you know. And yani you have to take a bus or a taxi to the uh, Haram in Mecca. Aziziyah, this is just next to Mina. Right after that, there is Mina. So this is $5,000. $5,000. And if we say six, then uh, 6,000 
that's you know and and more of course 6000 and more this is they call it the economy package it's not like a it's not like a big thing but then you get to stay in a hotel just next to the haram so that's 6000 you add to that the drafts and the other costs becomes 6000 6500 6700 uh, so with this money you might be able to sponsor three people or four people to perform Hajj from Bangladesh or Lebanon or Pakistan or Sri Lanka or somewhere, right? So this way, you will add three more Hajjat in your life or four more. It's as if you lived three or four more years, right? Now the Sheikh says, if you are from those who continuously perform Hajj every year, just to gain the reward of Hajj only, then I am sure that you will, uh, inshallah, apply this suggestion of mine uh, even at least once. If you are going every year to achieve the reward, then maybe you will apply what I'm telling you to do to sponsor others one time, even one time. As for if your goal behind repeating Hajj is enjoyment and siyaha, tourism, enjoyment and tourism. Because there are some people who, like, it's nice to travel and go around. And so instead of going to Hawaii or going, <laughs> you go to Hajj, you know. It's, it's nice, right? But then uh, it, it, you are investing the money in a better place. There is no doubt, right? But then is your goal to enjoy and travel and tourism or to get more reward so uh, if your intention is the reward then you might take the suggestion of the sheikh and apply it even once but if you are going for enjoyment and tourism or maybe for fame yani, to be heard of or for you wanting not to change what the people got used to about you that every year you are in Hajj. Yani this year they see you not in Hajj. Or what are you doing? What happened this year? You're not going. You don't want to change your habits. You want them to be staying the same. Then you are not, he's saying, if you are going for enjoyment and travel and you don't want to change your habits, right? Then you are not from those who are careful and diligent to expand or to elongate their productive lifespan to make their lifespan more productive you're not you're not really uh, careful about that now the sheikh says maybe someone would say i want to go for hajj by myself hoping that my chest will be opened up for iman for faith and the one who performs hajj by himself he's not like the one who's uh, يعني, hajj is being performed by others on his behalf uh, in terms of uh, changing his suluk, changing his behavior and manners, and his heart being full of iman, uh, that is, uh, the, the heart, there is no doubt, gets full of iman because of the nobility of the place and the nobility of the time. You know, you are doing a farida that is uh, so great and so effective in terms of increasing your iman. So, if your goal is like this, the Sheikh says, yani to go personally by yourself in order to increase your Iman and to have your heart full and to, be, to have your heart maintained by Iman, then I hope I ask Allah to reward you for your intention and to establish for you uh, your uh, wish. And uh, I ask Allah for you to uh, help you to, to love one of the means, one of the other means, one of the other means, uh, other than this one, so that you will uh, make your life uh, longer. So if you are someone who wants to go there because you want to increase your iman, then may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you what you wish, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open up a door for you in the other means that he will mention, by which, regarding hajj, by which you will make your lifespan more productive so that was the first one sponsor others for hajj if you sponsor others for hajj it's as if you have done it 
yourself. It's as if you have done it yourself. Remember, the Sheikh didn't mention this point, but the reward of Hajj that is Fard is not the same as the reward of Hajj that is Tatawa. Right? Once again, Hajj that is obligatory, the reward of it is not like the Hajj that is voluntary. So if you are sponsoring someone who is going to do his Fard Hajj Farida, your reward is just not the reward of voluntary Hajj. The reward is the reward of the Hajj of Farida, right? Which is far outweighs the reward of voluntary Hajj. Right? So even if you sponsor someone else, don't look down upon that, saying that you know you didn't do it yourself. You 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 are going for tatawa, you're going voluntary hajj. They are going fard. So you added the reward of three fard in your life if you sponsored three, right? So this is a lot of a lot of reward. The second means of uh, attaining the reward of hajj is salat al ishraq, salat al ishraq, ishraq means uh, when the sun rises right tushrik from sharq east right so uh, shams tushrik the sun rises from the east right this is the salah that is done after sunrise after sun rises so it is called al ishraq i hear many people they they say <laughs> al ishraq al ishraq this is associating partners in worship with allah Kaf at the end. Ishraq with Qaf. Right? Ishraq with Kaf. Of course, they don't mean it. So it is okay. But then it is better for them to fix this word. Now, Al Ishraq, Salatul Ishraq with a Qaf, not Kaf. Hmm? Qaf, Ishraq. He mentions at the footnote that many people they differentiate between Salat al Duha and Salat al Ishraq. And they think that they are two completely different prayers when they are just one prayer, one and the same prayer. It's just the name Ishraq is given to this Salah because it is done right after uh, sunrise. It is done right after uh, sunrise. So Salatul Ishraq is actually part of Salat al Duha. Salat al Duha, as was mentioned before, it is two up to eight rak'at. That is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa prayed. And then you can even pray more than that. You can pray more than that. So the one that you pray right after sunrise, 10 minutes after sunrise, Salat al-Duha, uh, this two rak'at, they are called Salat al-Ishraq. The one that is closer to Dhuhr time when the heat is strong, when the heat of the sun is strong, what is it called? Those who were here last week. Hmm? Salatu al awwabin Right? It is Salatu al duha the same. But it is given this term, Salatu al-Awwabin. Those who return to Allah in repentance a lot. Salatu al awwabin Hina tarmadu al-Fisal. The prayer of the awwabin, those who return to Allah a lot in repentance, is at the time when the sun is so much strong. The heat of it is so much strong to a point that the baby camel he cannot stand on the uh, on on his feet because his hoofs are still soft and the floor is so hot so he cannot stand and he sits just to avoid the heat of the sun so uh, salat al-ishraq there is the hadith of Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu anhu who said qala rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam man salla al-ghadata fi jama'ah thumma qa'ada yadhkuru allaha hatta tatla' hatta tatlu' al-shams thumma salla rak'atayn kanat lahu ka'ajri hajjatin wa umrah tamma 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 this hadith is in sunan of uh, al-tirmidhi it is an authentic hadith now it says the one who prays the morning prayer in congregation then he sits, or then he sat, remembering Allah until the sun rises. Then he prays two rak'at, then it will be for him like the reward of hajjah and umrah. Performing one pilgrimage and one umrah, 
Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said three times Tamma complete Tamma complete Tamma complete Tamma complete and perfect Perfect or complete Perfect, perfect, perfect Complete, complete, complete Three times So the one who prays Salat Al-Fajr Al-Ghada The morning prayer In congregation It doesn't say the masjid It says in congregation Right Generally you will pray in the masjid That's where the congregational prayer is But then it says in congregation Then he sits on Mentioning Allah Remembering Allah Until the sun rises Then he prays two rak'at Then it will be for him Like the reward of One hajjah One umrah Perfect 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 this prophetic sunnah, the Shaykh said, Very few are those who act upon it in many of the masajid today. And that is because of many reasons. Um, from the uh, main reasons why people don't pray this prayer, although it has this great reward, is As-saharu ila sa'atin muta'akhira fil layl. Staying up late at night to a late time at night. Especially, khususan fil ijazat, especially in the holidays. And this uh, hinders many, yu'iq, hinders uh, many from continuing to sit in the masjid up to sunrise and uh, praying uh, this salah. So people stay up late, so they barely wake up and attend the congregational prayer in the masjid then they want to go home they can't sit because they're tired they cannot sit and so uh, this is one of the reasons another reason is that some of the imams and some of the muadzineen the callers to prayers of the masajid may Allah increase them in carefulness and increase them in knowledge the sheikh makes dua for them uh, they refuse some of the imams and muadzineen they refuse that for anyone to stay in the masjid after salah out of them uh, being fearful they are afraid for the masjid to be uh, misused or mishandled or uh, things you know, that will happen to it that should not be happening so after prayer they will just you know close the doors and ask the people to leave so this is one of the reasons why this sunnah is not being uh, applied so uh, he says, uh, the Sheikh says that uh, I encourage you, uh, my Muslim brother, to take the means and the measures that will help you to achieve this, to, at, to at establish this sunnah, or at least that you will establish this sunnah uh, at the end of the week, في عطلة نهاية الأسبوع, in the weekend. In the weekend, when uh, generally there is nothing ties you up uh, uh, like dirasa, you know, you don't have to go to school, you don't have to go to your job because you are free, then at least in the weekend you do that, then you will attain the reward of two hajja and two umrah weekly. If you just do that over the weekend, so twice, alhamdulillah, يعني, two hajja and two umrah is not, is not little. So weekly you get two hajja and two umrah. Hmm? Uh, this way it's as if you lived two years longer and you performed hajj in them you performed hajj in them so this is the second way of adding more uh, to your life uh, in terms of uh, hajj and umrah so praying congregational prayers uh, praying the prayer in congregation then sitting to do dhikr doing dhikr until after sunrise, 10 minutes after sunrise, you pray two rak'at, and this way you will get the reward of one hajjah and one umrah that are perfect and uh, complete. Um, last week I mentioned this, but I mention it again, that the hadith says, um, in congregation, so supposedly even if you miss the salah in the masjid then you pray elsewhere in the apartment building in the musalla or in, with your neighbor and then you pray in congregation or with your family 
you gather your family together and pray in jama'ah, then sit and do dhikr until sunrise and then the two rak'at after 10 minutes, then you still, inshallah, uh, will be uh, getting the reward uh, of this uh, salah. Um, the Sheikh Abdul Aziz ibn Baz, alayhi rahmatullah, he said that for the women who pray in their homes, if they pray at home and then sit and do dhikr until sunrise and then they pray the two rak'at, he says for them too the same reward will be achieved. The same reward will be achieved. This is because going out to the masjid, this is for men. So if the women choose to stay at home, if the woman goes to the masjid and does the same thing, she will get the same reward. That is, that is another issue. But then it's better for the woman to pray at home. So the Sheikh says, there is no specific hadith uh, like explicit in this. But then he says that the same ruling apply because the woman is encouraged to pray at home. So if she prays at home, sits and does dhikr until sunrise, then after 10 minutes she prays the two rak'at, then she gets the same uh, reward that is hajja and umrah that is perfect, perfect, uh, perfect. The third uh, thing that will achieve for you the reward of Hajj is attending the durus al-ilm al muhadarat fil masajid to attend the sittings of knowledge and the lectures in the masajid. The Sheikh said that for you to attend every class or every lecture that is uh, performed or that is established in the masjid, then you will reward you will achieve the reward of a complete hajja. Abu Umama, radiallahu an, narrated from the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he said, Man ghada ila al-masjid, la yuridu illa an yata'allama khayran, aw yu'allimahu, kana lahu, kana lahu ka ajri hajjin, tamman hajjatuhu. It says, uh, this hadith is in al-Tabarani, uh, al-Hakim, uh, and uh, Sheikh al-Albani authenticated it and others uh, this hadith says the one who goes to the masjid uh, he doesn't want except to learn that which is good to learn something good or to teach it or to teach that which is good then he will have the reward of a pilgrim whose pilgrimage is complete the one who goes to attend a lecture to teach or to learn, to teach or to learn, he will have the reward of a hajj, a pilgrim, whose hajj, whose pilgrimage is complete, whose pilgrimage is perfect. The sheikh said that some people, they stay behind from attending the general lectures that are uh, done in the masajid either with the excuse that uh, the place is crowded in our case the parking lot is crowded <laughs> you don't want to go there you know the parking you don't find parking and <laughs> like that right or because of being busy with some matters that are side issues you know side matters that can be delayed you know you can you want to go to uh, do some groceries and take this and do that and these things you can do at other times right and therefore he would say that well this lecture is going to be recorded in a tape and I can buy this tape and listen to it in my car and that was in the old days where tapes were easy to record and dub and right now it's not uh, you know still the people use those mp3s and all of that but then I don't know, for myself, I, I feel it's not as easy as it used to be, this thing, uh, computerized <laughs> stuff. But anyhow, uh, I will listen to it from the website, you know, they will post it, inshallah, <laughs> right? And then they don't post it and you don't listen to it even after they post it. You come to ask about it, is it posted? <laughs> oh no, it's not posted now. When is it gonna be posted? Inshallah, they will do it. And then after they do it, <laughs> Nobody listens to it, right? <laughs> so this, although 
if you are going to say, well, I will listen to it in my car, and the Sheikh says that this uh, thing, there is nothing wrong with this, that you are making use of the time that you are spending in your car uh, by listening to that which is beneficial in your religion. That, that is a good thing. But then on the other hand, you are depriving yourself from a lot of good, a lot of reward, which you will not be attaining, you will not be achieving, except by uh, basically he's saying to, to go to the masajid and be close to the scholars in the sittings of remembrance. Uh, and you will uh, also miss uh, rewards. And he, first of all, being with the scholars firsthand is not the same as listening it to, uh, to it in your car. Secondly, he said that uh, you will miss achieving the reward of a complete hajjah, a complete hajjah. You will, miss, you will be missing that reward. Also, that you will be missing the fact that you will not stand up from this sitting except that your evil deeds have been turned into good deeds. There, are, there is an authentic hadith in this meaning. Inshallah, next time we'll, we'll get it. Yani, they are told, those who sit in the sittings of remembrance, Stand up, you are forgiven. Your evil deeds have been changed into good deeds. In one of the narrations, they say, so and so, he didn't really want to come. He just came with the crowd, like they dragged him, you know. <laughs> Those, they wanted to come. He really didn't have intention to come. But then they brought him, he went along. He tagged along with them, right? So it is said, even him, forgive, he is forgiven. Even him, he is forgiven. They are the people whom the one who sits with them, the one who accompanies them, he will never be sad. The people of remembrance, the one who accompanies them, he will never be a sad person. So even if he's someone who's just tagging along, going with the flow, as they say, well, he came and he gathered with them, then he is forgiven also. Even if in the first place he didn't really want to go, but then he just tagged along, just happened, not pre-planned, but then that person is also uh, forgiven. Also, for him to attend, yani one of the things that he will miss is him attending the dua, the dua of good. Because in these sittings, most of the time, you find, may Allah forgive us, may jazahullah khayran rahimahullah, like this. Right? So he will be missing those duas that are done. And yani he's listening to the tape in the car, so he's missing this. Also, ihfafu al the fact that the angels will surround the people who are in the sittings of knowledge. Iwa Allahi lah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will shelter him and will take him as a guest and he will look after him. Right? The hadith of the three people that passed when Rasulullah sallallahu was sitting in the masjid. One of them, he got closer, found a spot and sat in it. The other one, he just sat wherever he reached. The third one, he left. Right? So Rasulullah sallallahu said about the first one who got in and found him a spot and sat, Awa ila Allah, Allah Azza wa Jal Awa. Yani he came to Allah and Allah took him. Took him and looked after him. Right? Gave him refuge, gave him uh, shelter. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. As for the one who sat wherever he got, Stahya, Fastahya Allah min. He got shy. So Allah treated him in the same way, with shyness. As for the third one who left, he turned away, so Allah turned away from him. Right? This happens a lot. Many times, you know, you come to a masjid, people are sitting to, for remembrance, you find people getting up and leaving. They don't have anything. They don't need to go. <laughs> but then, they're just not interested. 
That's it. يعني. Not interested. It is sad that those are people from the people who go to the masajid. We're not saying that attending is a must. And if you don't attend the halaqa, then <laughs> we were not saying that. It's only all a matter of reward. Right? Some people may be sinful. Those who have no knowledge of anything and they are missing important information that, uh, that is crucial. Because knowledge, part of it is a must. Part of it is a recommended thing. So those who are rec missing the knowledge that is a must, they are sinful by leaving. They are sinful by leaving. Those who don't know, they have to ask about the things that they need to know. If they don't, they are sinful. That is a disobedience that they are committing. It's not uh, an excuse to say, I don't know. You don't know, ask those who know. Ask those who know. And if there are sittings of knowledge that are set up for this objective and you are turning away from it, then on the day of judgment, blame nobody but yourself. And uh, we hope that Allah will save all of us from being told in the grave, as in that long hadith that you've heard a few weeks ago in the khutbah. When the man is questioned in the grave, he says, I don't know, I don't know. He will be told, لا دريت ولا تلوت. In one narration, تلوت. لا دريت ولا تلوت. لا دريت ولا تلوت. You did not know and you did not follow someone who knows. You did not know and you did not follow someone who knows. Uh, so now so these are some of the benefits that you will achieve if you attend in person in the masjid, those sittings of knowledge. Uh, he says, and, and the likes of these, of the excellences or the virtues, that you will find them spread, the benefits of seeking knowledge, you will find them in the chapters, in the books of hadith, under the reward of seeking knowledge. So the sheikh encourages us not to become lazy and not to stay back, not to hold back from these halaqat, study circles and durus lessons or classes in the masajid. And what we should uh, also uh, have in our hearts when we attend these sittings of knowledge, we should nastahdir in niyyah. We should remind ourselves of uh, the intention. The intention, why are we coming here? Right? He said we should also have the intention of having the listeners to these lectures to have the number of the listeners to be more. And even if you just intend to maximize the number of the people who are attending those lectures, because this raises up the morale, raises up the morale of the lecturer, raises up the morale of the lecturer, the one who comes sometimes from a very far place and going through a lot of enduring yani, the uh, problems and the difficulties of traveling, then he wouldn't find, uh, after all these efforts that one is spending, he doesn't find listening to him except very few uh, number of people. And this might lead the lecturer to refuse other invitations to go to give a lecture like that in the same place. That is because he did not see from the people any um, that they're not really uh, caring about it they do not have any uh, diligence or care or importance to these lectures and lessons that uh, are being done and this is something that is true we invite scholars from overseas and they go through a lot and then you know some people uh, oh he was just here a few months ago I mean, he was here and you got you learned all the knowledge that he has so you don't have to come again or is it like when we have somebody new some people they come I don't know it's just like to see the the love of watching someone who's new and then they don't show up again right so this is not this is not suitable uh, as for the imams of the masajid the sheikh says then this hadith should be uh, encouraging them and should give them 
reasons to uh, give more lectures, to give more lectures and more beneficial words to the congregation of the masjid. And the imam should have this intention, uh, uh, the intention in his mind, this hadith, يعني, that he wants to get the reward of a hajjah, right? Every time he wants to give a, a talk or an admonishment in the masjid so that he will achieve uh, by this intention the greatest number uh, possible of hajj, of hajj. The more is done, the more you have uh, a change, uh, you, have, you have achieved uh, pilgrimages. And uh, it is on the lecturer, if he was asked to give any uh, lecture or a class, that he should uh, be careful and diligent not to give this talk or a lecture except in one of the houses of Allah, except in one of the masajid, uh, intending not to miss, not to miss the reward of the hajja for himself and for those who are listening. Sometimes people invite you to go to a home or to uh, a place where it's not a masjid, right? Uh, other than the, mas the, the places other than the masajid, they are not the same. If you go to the masjid, then it's a hajjah, right? For yourself and those who are listening. So you should try to reserve those lectures to uh, the masjid or restrict them to the masjid. Of course, it's okay to go elsewhere. Depends on the situation. But then you should try to do your best to have these done in the masjid for every lecture that is attended. Then it is the reward of a, a hajjah, hajjan tamman hajjatuhu. A pilgrim whose hajj is complete and done. If you have done hajj, you know what it means. When it's on the 12th day or the 13th day of the hijjah, you are finished all your rites of hajj and you are getting to go home. You are you know, getting ready to go home. You know that feeling, what it is. It's a hajj that is complete. You are done. All your rites are perfect. Alhamdulillah, everything is done. Right? Those who haven't performed Hajj, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will uh, help them and assist them to perform Hajj and they will get that feeling, uh, but then it's uh, an excellent feeling to go through the Hajj and to achieve it. Exactly like when you are afraid that you will miss Salah and then you are able to do it and you are able to do it on time and then Alhamdulillah, الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله. Sometimes you get squeezed and you are trying to pray and on time and you are afraid, afraid to miss. And then, بإذن الله, you are doing it and you do it on time. You feel happy that you achieved this and you did not commit the sin of missing the uh, fard prayer on time. Uh, this is how it is. It is an achievement. So every lecture that one attends then the reward of a complete hajjah uh, I think uh, hmm? yeah because I don't see the okay the clock is not here so if you want to have uh, questions we can do a little bit after but we are done just because you asked but so subhanak Allahumma bihamdik ashadu an la ilaha illa anta استغفرك وأتوب إليك تؤذن إن شاء الله جزاكم الله خير فيكم بارك الله